So we'll heat the whole loop up. We'll pressurize this container and pump the salt into here. And then within here is a pump. There'll be a, a motor mounted up top, a long shaft, and then the bottom here is the, the impeller of the pump. And there's a little picture of it here. It's currently out being assembled. The salt will be pumped through a test section, silicon carbide pipe almost. It, currently it's upside down. So if you, if you imagine it flipped around, upside down, and then inserted in this spot here, we're gonna fill it full of these little graphite spheres. They're about three centimeters. And we'll fill it up about this, this much is kind of illustrating how many of these uh, 600 spheres will be inside of it. And the idea is we're testing a reactor concept where the fuel would be inside these pebbles, fuel pebbles in here, and that's where the fission and the heat's created. And you got flowing flybe over it. We're using an inductive power supply, which would be located on the outside here. So it comes in kind of through the wall here around the test section and it inductively heats the pebbles without using fission, it's kind of the only way to really get heat into the system. Can I ask um, yep. what the um, theory was between uh, around using a sort of a solid fuel pebble into the fly rather than dissolving the actinide into the salts? Currently in this country, we're not really looking at the molten salt uh, fuel systems. So the driver from a, from a programmatic research was either a solid fuel or the, or the pebble. But there must be some advantages to doing the solid fuel or it's just, it's just an extension from previous research study really? The applicability of molten salt fuel systems or can be tested also in the system. This is the base for an awful lot more of our testing. For example, we'll be doing natural circulation safety testing. We're doing a lot of corrosion specimens in here in a pumped loop. Silicon carbide, even though we're using that as part of the design, that's part of the test. We're going to find out how that performs in a salt environment now. Mm. Now, and there are a number of technologies that have never been done before in salt in here. That rotating flange up there to allow things to shift between there. The fact that we've got ceramic and metal pieces all in a single loop. The joints, which are the nickel uh, carbon based joints, so we can actually use gasketed seals. This one does uh, flow. So as the salt flows through it, it sends sound waves through. It kind of like the car going by and it makes yeah, a different yeah. sound. Yeah, Doppler yeah, effect, there you go. And that and it measures the Doppler shift. Nice. Kevin, mention the fluidic diodes, uh, what you can do yep. with that. Simply put, it's a way to control a liquid flow without using like a valve. Part of a safety system that's used in uh, the molten salt reactor, I believe had them, and also liquid metal reactors, where during normal operation, the flow goes one direction through it. So it would flow in normal operation, it goes this way, it comes in this side and out this side, and that creates a lot of uh, resistance. It spins around and comes out. During an accident, the flow reverses and goes this way, and there's not a lot of resistance going from here, just flowing out here, because it doesn't spin around. So that's the, after the particle bed concept test, that's the next set of tests, is to test this idea for the safety system. Most of the technologies that for a molten salt reactor in the, as far as the thermohydraulics, well, they're identical. If you want to use the salt as a coolant, it's just much, much, much easier to do something that's non-radioactive uh, on this. So that's why we have the walk before you fly. The direction that we've gone uh, with the FHR technology is to look at the use of the same kinds of coated particle fuels that have been developed and tested for helium-cooled reactors to get functional commercial reactors operating sooner than we can with liquid fuel. There are advantages specific to thorium fuel over uranium fuel when it's dissolved in molten salt. But first, let's start with some of the advantages common to all molten salt reactors, even those which use solid fuel instead of liquid fuel. Much of their research can be applied to liquid fuel molten salt reactors as well. It's all laying out that fundamental research so that someday a thorium reactor, you can look up these papers and these publications that we've written in here and be like, oh, this is how we can do this, you know? So we're studying the fundamental science behind it, um, thorium fueled or otherwise. Hi, my name is Grant Buster. I'm a graduate student here at the Thermal Hydraulics Laboratory at UC Berkeley. I work to develop a fundamental understanding of of how pebble fuel moves through a reactor core. This is kind of the central column, and this would be rotated around. It's kind of an annulus, uh, a donut-shaped core. Um, some will exit the reactor core quite quickly, while others will be held up for you know, maybe months at a time. Every time we, we defuel a pebble, you can actually assay these pebbles using gamma ray spectroscopy. 
to uh, discern what the burn up is of this pebble and whether it should be placed back into the core or whether it should be put in storage. When you change your fuel type in a light water reactor, it's a huge deal. You have, to, you have to get the new vendor to design and you have to figure out the compatibility of the new fuel assemblies with the old fuel assemblies and how you're going to shuffle them and, and then the fuel will stay for three refueling cycles before it's fully spent. It's very complicated. In fact, if you think about how it is that you buy gasoline compared to how it is you buy nuclear fuel these days. Buy nuclear fuel, you're locked into your vendor. Yeah. You know, with gasoline, if you want new gasoline, you just go to a different gas station, right? And you fill up your tank with the new gasoline. You don't worry about it being exactly identical. Pebbles are very interesting because you can just put in a few pebbles to test. Once you verify that the new pebble design that you have is working, you can start to just substitute because it's a homogeneous bed, new stuff. Mm -hmm. Pebble fuel is fairly well understood. It's been, it's been being used since like the 70s now. In Germany, it was a helium cooled reactor. It was a dry bed, so all the pebbles were weighted downwards. Additionally, they drove in control rods from the top. If you can imagine, they crushed a lot of pebbles. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't like round or make a, like a nose cone? They or? did, but it's still a confined bed. There's not a whole lot of movement. All the pebbles were weighted under gravity and it was just not a very um, smart system. But with our system, everything's um, buoyant, almost neutrally so. So the pebbles are very light, so to speak. With molten salt coolant, graphite is less dense than salt and floats. And therefore, fuel elements want to float. We realize that it might be an advantage that, pebble, that, that fuel floats if you have pebbles. Because in a salt-cooled reactor, you want to have the coolant in a vessel that has no openings around the bottom. That is a pool type of configuration, which means you don't want to take the fuel out from the bottom of the reactor, right? You want to take it from the top. You want to take it from the top. Gravity-driven control blades against the buoyancy um, with degrees of freedom on the bottom, the forces on these pebbles are much, much smaller. So all we had to do was to find a 40% scale pebble material uh, that would have the right density ratio. I went home that evening and went to the kitchen and started taking out my wife's plastic stuff and cutting it up to see what would float. <laughs> and after destroying a lot of perfectly good, you know, plastic wear, I finally got around to cutting up a milk jug. This is science at work. <laughs> that says, science right. at work. And the stuff floated. And then I looked on the bottom and I looked up the recycle number. We sourced polypropylene, tiny little pebbles, and they have a 13 thousandths of an inch tungsten wire through the center. You can see the tungsten wires. This is the uh, control blade insertion experiment. The blade is kind of a phantom because um, it's plastic. You can't really see it so well. But you can see it moving all the pebbles. See the shadow of it, it's like oh. pressure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you could actually image these large beds. So we've had to develop our own tomography software, tell where all the pins are, reconstruct how the actual three-dimensional pebble bed is physically. The stress chains that are actually created in these granular beds are quite complex. And the white lines where the blade was, the concentration of displacements right around the tip, those are the pebbles undergoing the largest amount of imparted force. You gotta see that they're, they're propagated up quite far. But once again, the, uh, the forces that we measured were one order of magnitude less than the recommended force limits. So um, we have pretty high confidence that this is a viable um, shutdown method. Will the molten salt provide lubrication? Also lubrication, yeah. Yeah, the lubrication can only help us, really. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you guys um, have, have heard a lot about this, but essentially sign out the Shanghai Institute of Applied Science um, is, has a very aggressive program with uh, molten salt reactors. Um, they're, they're doing a two-pronged approach where they build solid fuel test reactors um, with pebble fuel um, and also molten salt um, uh, dissolved thorium um, test thorium, reactors right as well. Thorium. Huh? Right. Thorium. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thorium. Dissolve, dissolve thorium fuel in so, the molten salt. Okay. Um, similar to that uh, molten salt reactor experiment in America. So uh, why aren't we working on liquid uh, fuel? Well, our lab is, is specifically designed the PVFHR, the pebble fuel variant, right. and the idea- I the United States in general. Oh, licensing. Licensing a liquid fuel reactor, commercial especially in the US right now, is scary. 
The U.S. is electing to go after a salt-cooled reactor at first. It is not to say that the U.S. doesn't recognize that molten salt reactors have some very interesting, advantageous capabilities, but they are a more technically challenging thing to do. So what is a fluoride salt-cooled high-temperature reactor? Essentially, it uses coated particle ceramic fuel. A fluoride salt is a primary coolant. Dr. David Holocomb is about to describe the safety features of Ornell's reactor design. Just like the Berkeley pebble bed, all the safety features you will hear also apply to reactors where the fuel is dissolved into molten salt. Our definition for strong passive safety in this is there's no requirement for an active response to avoid either core damage or larger off-site release following even severe accidents, and that's ever. This isn't three days, this is, this is ever. If, if it just goes black, uh, black we don't, you don't have to do anything. Large margin to fuel failure, good natural circulation coolant, very good negative temperature reactivity, it shuts itself off rather than going out of control. High radionuclide solubility in the salt. If you actually did have major fuel failure, well, you've converted your reactor into a molten salt reactor uh, if you go ahead and you fail all the fuel. <laughs> It's a low-pressure system. There's no driving force to cause things to go outward on uh, in in this, uh, and which also helps you to make containment barriers, because I don't need containment barriers to be very strong. Turns out we're designing a thing with four layers of containment ba barrier because they're relatively easy to do. You put a stainless steel dome around things and you've got a containment barrier. We can use things like fusible links. You can set melt point alloys that are 10 or 15 or 20 degrees above your normal operating point and all your control rods are linked by a melt point and just to let them passively drop in. You can have a poison salt injection system which is just held shut by a melt point uh, system because we do have a lot more margin and that's some Something which is distinctive to us because we're not anywhere near uh, temperature limits uh, for short terms for anything. We just let things heat up until you get to a melt point and you, and you stick in a lot of negative reactivity. You have hundreds of hours before you even get one in a million uh, type failures uh, at 1600 C if you've operated it at low enough temperatures. Uh, and this, there's, a, there's a large volumetric change in the salt with temperature which says that our passive natural circulation cooling has got a very strong driving force which means that we can rely upon natural circulation which gives us the ability of making very large reactors because the natural circulation is not something which is limited that I have to wick stuff out to the side. I can go ahead and just continue to use normal types of cooling and just reject it to the uh, to the atmosphere, which says that my re upper limit on my reactor size is actually my grid, not my, my, not my reactor safety. By focusing on, on the areas that, uh, that give us the most leverage in terms of the benefits of the salts, and trying to, in other areas, stay with what's been done historically, uh, it will reduce the, sort of the number of fences we have to jump over. I'm Raluca Scarlat, I'm a PhD student at UC Berkeley. I do research on fluoride salt cooled advanced reactors. They're cooled by fluoride salt, but the fuel is not dissolved in the salt, so it's in, in solid form. It's zoned, meaning that you have the blanket of thorium. It serves a similar purpose as online chemical re reprocessing does in the lifter reactor. So this, this project was built maybe four or five years ago and we were considering a very complex core design. So this isn't like multiple fuel regions. Really in the middle it's going to be just one so, type of fuel. Dark green were pure graphite pebbles for shielding. The green was a thorium blanket. There's a lot of potential, but the designs right now are, are much more simple with just one fuel layer and one outer shielding layer. You um, couldn't actually do it then with the thorium. The PBFHR we're, we're designing as a 19 point something enriched U-235, so it's just uranium, yeah. Solid fuel is the fundamental barrier, which impedes thorium being used as a much more efficient source of energy. We've studied and we've tried to identify ways to design solid fuel reactors to utilize thorium effectively, and it's very challenging. Their capabilities look, in terms of, of fuel utilization conversion ratio, look remarkably similar to light water reactors.